uh, to talk to you. There we go. Well, it's so good to see you guys uh, again going through another week. Uh, man, I don't know about you, but it seems like these weeks are just flying by. We are already in August. We are already in the dog days of August. And uh, it's just uh, it just seems like this to me this year is just really, really going fast. But thank the Lord. Uh, hey, he's kept us through this. And each week we continue to meet together and uh, and keep getting stronger in the word. All right. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Elder Barry Brooks. I am the Sabbath School Superintendent for Southeast uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, again, we are glad to see you here at Southeast Sabbath School. All right. Uh, now that we've got, see, just a couple of, just a, a one announcement I wanted to make before we get started. Uh, just wanted to let you know that we are collecting funds for uh, for backpacks for our kids at Rama, for those who may not be able to get backpacks, we are trying to, you know, not only get them, but also if we have some extra cash, we're going to either fill them with, with uh, school supplies. So we are asking for you not to take anything away from your tithe, of course, and, and definitely anything from your offering. But we're asking if you have a few extra dollars to put it into your uh, situation, put it into your, on your envelope, uh, and let us know, uh, let, uh, brother Keith know that you are giving to, uh, uh, the backpack fund. We do this every year. We kind of backed off for the last two years because of COVID, but now that things are going back, you know, kids are going back to school. Well, they need our help. So, uh, we are asking you to just take maybe 10 bucks if you can, or more to give us, uh, toward backpacks. And we're, we appreciate anything that you do. Uh, I'll see you at church tomorrow. Uh, if you have anything that you wanna put in my hand, uh, that'll be fine too. And I'll make sure that it's reported uh, appropriately. So uh, let's try to help our kids get these pack backpacks together and have some good ones that we can give. And hopefully we can all also uh, fill them up. So, and also with, to, with saying that, I know uh, what, we do have a Rayma alumni who's teaching us tonight. And that's uh, Dana Edmonds. So it's good to see him on. And uh, Dana, I, I just want to uh, just say thank you in public. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor, for coming out. I know you're on the road. You're doing things. We just appreciate you coming. And and you know, when I asked when I asked Pastor if he would like to, you know, do it, this is his second time doing it for us. And I mean, he is just so giving. No problem. Say, Barry, I got you. Just you know, here, let's let's put it on my schedule. And uh, I really appreciate him taking time because this guy is out on the road all the time. So uh, let me give you a little bit about, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Pastor Edmonds. Uh, he is one of, uh, uh, actually, he is he is uh, one of our first members. He's a charter member at Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, right here, right here in our home. Uh, just to give you a little bit about him, he was born and raised here in Cleveland. Uh, I met him when we were kids. Uh, not too long ago, Dana, not too long ago, <laughs> when we were kids over at Glenville Church, and uh, um, we just had a, a, a great, you know, great relationship there, and then he also, he became, him and his parents came over to uh, be charter members of the Southeast, Southeast Church. He was also uh, the first AYS leader, we used to call it MV, and uh, for those who remember, he graduated, he's a graduate of Rama Junior Academy. Uh, he's been 44 years in the ministry. Uh, he's also, he's spent 36 years in South Central Conference. And currently he's the executive director of the Office for Regional Conference Ministries. He's been married for over 44 years to the lovely Jill Robinson Edmond of Lexington, Kentucky. He has two adult children, uh, Ms. Courtney Edmond Campbell, uh, a Southeast, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, church school in Nashville, Tennessee, and Robert James, RJ, uh, cardiac, he's the cardiac rehab uh, at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. He also has four grandchildren. And you're talking about a, a really nice guy. Uh, I'm Again, we've known each other since teenagers. And he has, one thing I can say about 
Pastor Edmund. He has never changed. When you walk up to him, he, he, he doesn't forget you. And he knows who you are. And he's always has an open heart, open hand to shake your hand. Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. So uh, again, uh, Pastor, good to see you here with us. Uh, tell us a little bit before we get started. Tell us a little bit about your current position uh, and, and how that helps our pastors. I'm sorry. Tell us a little bit. You broke up a little bit on me, uh, Brother Elder Barry. Uh, tell us about what? Oh, I was just, I was just saying. You know, tell us about a little bit about your current position and how it oh, helps our conferences and our pastors. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am, as you mentioned, the executive director for the Office of Regional Conference Ministries in Huntsville, Alabama. And what that what what I do is I coordinate all of the activities that a regional conferences do together. And when regional conferences um, the way regional conferences operate, they actually operate like a union. So let me give you an example, a couple of examples of things we do. We have, the regional conferences have their own retirement uh, uh, pr uh, program. Um, uh, the regional conferences operate their own, like you have the Columbia Union Visitor, the regional conferences have the regional voice and you can get that, you can get that Right. online a uh, project that we we just had our we just had our uh one of our four yearly board meetings in orlando florida my office coordinates the board meetings that we have uh and we met in what's called black caucus and that is a meeting of all the uh african american administrators in the uh, in the North Division, I, I just met with um, your Vice President, uh, Elder Joel Johnson. Uh, he was with us in Orlando. The Treasurer could not come because um, uh, she has some health challenges with her daughter. She asked us to be sure and pray for her. Um, and of course, Elder Brown could not come because he was scheduled to do an evangelistic meeting. The big, the big project we're doing right now is our office was charged with building an office complex that housed our ministries, Breath of Life. Most of you have heard of Breath of Life. Um, our office subsidizes Breath of Life to the tune of $300,000 a year. Um, and so Breath of Life will be in our new building. Retirement will be in our new building. Regional Voice will be in our new building. Uh, my office will be in our new building. Um, it is a 30 square foot $9 million building that is supposed to be finished this month. And when, when they hand uh -huh. me the keys, I will hand them a check that, that clears the indebtedness for the building. So uh -huh. um, we have a $9 million building that we will, we will open debt free. Praise the Lord. That's, that's awesome. The, the, yeah, praise the Lord. It saved us several hundred thousand dollars in interest. Um, so we're we're so that's a, that's a little. I don't I don't know how helpful that was, but that tells you a little bit about what we do. No, sir, that was very helpful, and uh, it's awesome. I think you know again, again uh, it shows how prudent our conferences you know our conferences are by opening up a building the debt free that's awesome uh and again uh where you can have more funds going toward the goals that you guys have set for the different conferences and the pastors so yeah thank you so much for you know for all you do and at this point i'm going to throw it back to you sir so we can get started with uh your teaching in sabbath school thank you so much again Thank you very much. Now tell me, tell me, you told me once and I forgot. So tell me how much time do I have? So I'll make sure I don't go over. You you have at least minimum 930. We sometimes we go past that. So you take your time. And if they're, you know, if we're looking good and how I can do is help you too. I can help you with uh, 
uh, with the hands raised as well as there's going to be some people who have some things on the chat. I may interrupt you. So bear with me who may, you know, want to make a comment or ask a question on our chat. So, uh, but I, I will be here to help you out. I appreciate that. That'll enable me if I don't have to check the screen for questions and, and the chat, that'll help me a lot because um, I'm trying to operate two devices. And so um, given my limited tech skills, I can use all the help I can get. Um, first of all, let me say right. what a privilege uh, to, be, to be a part of this Sabbath school discussion and, the, and what a privilege it is uh, to be back home, albeit electronically. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm, my family, my mom, my dad, um, and I, um, and my brother and my sister, uh, my youngest sister, I think my oldest sister was married by that time, but um, we are all charter members of Southeast. Um, as a matter of fact, as I shared when I was there in April, I had the privilege of, of sharing the word at the end of April. In fact, that's when you asked me to come. And I shared, as I always share when I come, I grew up literally one block over from Southeast. Um, um, and so I remember as a little boy walking by um, the, the, the lot that on my way to Rama, the lot that is now Southeast, there was nothing there. Um, and, but that, that's home for me. Um, and um, I'm always delighted with any opportunity I can return home, particularly if I can return home when it's not winter time. Uh, <laughs> having lived in the South for the last, having lived in the South and the, and the Caribbean uh, uh, for most of the last 40 years, um, I can't do cold weather anymore, Elder Brooks, um, um, but um, I'm excited to be home. Let's talk about, let's, let's, let's move right into our Sabbath school lesson. Elder Brooks has already prayed for us, so let's move in. We have been talking all about the, about being in the crucible. And, and basically what we're talking about is the, it are the challenges that God allows us to go through, the hard, sometimes the very hard times that God allows us to go through. Um, and, 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 and the point that I wanna start off with is, that God is trying to use those hard times to save us. The challenge though, there, there are a couple of challenges for God in that while he is trying to use these difficult times, those challenges to try to save us, at the same time, he's trying to use those the, the crucible to save us, the devil is trying to use the crucible to discourage us and cause us to be lost. And this and this, this, this Sabbath school lesson talked about uh, at the very beginning, uh, two people who went through the same experience, the loss of a child. For one, it made them bitter, the other, it made them better. And so we need to understand that God is trying to use the crucible, we know that. But what we don't what we don't think about all the time is the devil is trying to use the crucible too to discourage us, and, and so and so sometimes 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 I think about how hard it must be for God to be God, and, and, and let me let, let, let me give an example. I one of the not one in the greatest privilege. And the biggest challenge that I've ever had in my life came from doing the same thing. And that is being a conference president. I had the privilege of being the president of South Central Conference for seven years. It was the greatest privilege, but it was also the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life. And the reason why it's the most was the most difficult thing is, and, and your president, my friend Elder Brown is going through the same thing because there are a significant amount of people who will judge you by the last thing that you did that they liked. So you can, you can make 99 decisions in a row 
that people like. But if the 100th decision is the decision they don't like, then the first 99 decisions don't matter. And, and this is what I used to say to my, to my uh, staff when I was a conference president. I used to say, I have the same desire to be liked that you have. I used to say, I do not wake up every morning and say, who can I make mad at me today? I don't do that. I said, but one of the things I've learned as a leader, that the right thing for people is not always the popular thing with people. And so, and so I used to tell my staff, I've learned that I cannot do my job and make everybody like me all the time. I used to say, I cannot do my job without making some of you mad some of the time. So my goal is simple. My goal is just not to have all of y'all mad at the same time. Okay. But think about what it's like to be God. God, in order to save us, God does things to us, or God allows, I shouldn't say God does things to us, but God allows things to be done to us that make us, that make us mad at God, All right? Um, and even though the story of Job tells us that those things do not originate with God, okay? God simply allows those things. And, but, but here, but what happens is God does, God gets blamed for the things that the devil does. At Elder Brooks, you're in the insurance business. You insurance people call disasters acts of God. Now, those things are, are actually caused by Satan but God gets blamed for them and people yep. get mad at God, right? But right. God simply allows Satan to, to do those things in order to save us. And, 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 and what needs to, you know, sometimes we make deals with the devil and we say, okay, God, um, I'm, I'm gonna serve you. And, but then at a certain point, I'm gonna break away and serve God. But the thing that needs to make us back away from any dealings with the devil is the devil causes bad things. The devil, the devil causes things to happen to us to put us in the cubicle, I mean, in the crucible, knowing that those things are going to allow at least some people to start serving God. The truth of the matter is there are at least some people listening to me today. The only reason why you're serving God today is, it's, is be, it started with you getting tired of the devil whipping you, whipping you upside the head and knocking you down. And it was when the devil knocked you flat on your back you look up and like the prodigal sons said, I will arise and go to my father, right? Now the prodigal son didn't say that until it was in the crucible, which the mm. devil allowed, which the devil caused. The devil knows that at least some of us will leave him because of the bad things that he does to us. But he hates us so much that he does bad things to us anyway. He can't help himself, even though he knows that if he just would leave us alone, a lot of us would stay with him. But he can't help himself. <laughs> That's the yep. think, think about it for a minute. Think about it for a minute. Yeah. The, what's the worst thing that the of all the horrible things that the devil has done in the last 6,000 years. What's the worst thing that the devil has done? And I need somebody to answer. What's the worst thing that the devil has done? 
Anybody? I would say the atomic bomb being released. I would. Okay. I would all right, say, somebody else? Uh, I would say he's caused all these wars and just killing after killing, just taking the lives of so okay. many. To me, that's one of the worst okay. things. Okay, terrible. Okay, one more person. Anybody, anybody uh, want to? Brother Miller, I mean, Deacon Miller. Deacon Miller. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, with all the wars and stuff, and, and especially all the Edgewoods that he's got out and about, all the Jesuits has killed people as they, with their beliefs. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, here's and all of and all of you, you might be right. I don't think there's a, a right answer or wrong answer, but here, Elder Brooks. Catholic school class, here's the worst thing that I think the devil ever did. And that was the crucifixion of the Son of God. Causing men to kill the Son of God. That's an awful thing, right? Okay. But that thing is the thing that sealed his own doom. The death of Jesus Christ sealed the devil's fate eternally. Don't you think the devil knew that? Of course he did. You would think that the last thing that the devil would want would be for Jesus to die on the cross. If I were the devil, I would be snatching the nails out of out of Jesus's hands. And I would have I would have thought of some way to prevent Jesus from dying. But the devil hated Jesus so much that he killed Jesus and in effect killing Jesus killed him. And Jesus's death caused well, is the means of us being saved. And when we are saved, the devil then has to suffer for all the things that he did to the people who are, who are, who are saved. And so the, the devil had absolutely no reason, no logical reason to put Jesus through the ultimate crucible. And that is Calvary. But he hates, he hated Christ and he hates us so much that he was willing to, 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 to hurt himself just to hurt Christ. Hey, Pastor. And so uh, that's we have a, a hand yeah. up. All right. We, uh, we, uh, a good friend of yours, Sister Betty Robinson. Robinson, good oh, to Pastor. good to see. I guess I will see you. It's good to see you, Sister Robinson. Thank you, and it's good to hear you, hear your voice. Um, that is the answer that I was going to give uh, the dying on the cross. But the thing that I wanted to say is, Satan can't help himself. He is beyond redemption. And uh, I, I, I remember reading, I think it was in the story of redemption that uh, after he made a mess of things in heaven, he was hanging around and whatnot. Uh, maybe even with, I'll just say crocodile tears or whatever. But Sister White let us know that there was no sincere repentance. And so he would never be allowed back into the fold. He is who he is, and, and we need to know that, those of us on earth. He would just as soon kill us as anybody else. You, you are absolutely right, Mr. Robinson. And that's the reason why we can't fool with him. Because he is, he is irredeemable, and his hatred for us is such that he will do harm to us knowing that it 
that that harm will cause at least some of us to turn away from him and turn to Christ. But he hurts us anyway because that's who he is. Yes. Right? And so, but the, but, but, but the, uh, the question for us during this Sabbath school is why does God allow that? And, and, by, and, and by the way, Sister Robinson, that story that you mentioned is in Story of Redemption, which is a book that I happen to be re rereading again I'm, I'm on the last few chapters. And that's one of the very first, that's one of the very first stories that Ellen White says in Story of Redemption. Uh, so the question is, and remember I started off early saying it is, it must be difficult to be God because God because God loves his children. And all of us who have children, we spend our lives trying to make things better for our children. We spend our lives, we spend our lives as far as possible shielding our children from harm. Um, in fact, uh, my, my daughter, I tell, I, I tell my daughter, she's overprotective because she, she the, the slightest, she, she is afraid of the slightest harm coming to her, to her child. And so we spend our lives trying to shield us from harm. But the, th these, but the, the crucible, the exact opposite of that. It is God, a loving God doing the exact opposite of most of us as parents, allowing us to be placed in harm's way. And so the question is, why does God allow that? Because God could easily prevent every single bad thing that ever happens to you in your life. Now, now keep in mind, uh, some of those things are results of bad choices. You know, we, we blame the devil when, when a lot of the bad things that happen to us actually start with another D and that's called decision. But God could even, just like, just like sometimes we, we prevent our children from reaping the results of their bad choices. We do that sometimes. And God could allow us to he could stop us from reaping the results of our poor decisions. So the question is, why does God do the God who is the ultimate parent? Why does God allow, why does God do the opposite of what we do? And that is do everything possible to keep us out, of, keep our children out of harm's way. Why does God allow us to go through the crucifixion? I have a hand, uh, Deacon Miller. Yeah, my answer would be, you know, God gave us the freedom of choice. So it's on us whether we go with what God wants us to do or we go against it. Yeah, okay, yeah. but does, okay, and that's true. But aren't, isn't it also true that there are crucibles that come independent of any choice that we make, right? Or are all crucibles are the results of our own decisions? That's another question. I would have to say from our own decisions. Okay, I think it's a combination. so... Uh, Okay, who said who said it's a combination? That was me. That was me. I said it's a combination of both, not only our own decisions, but also that that the devil knows what our decisions because he's been around here so long that he knows certain things don't change and he knows that these decisions that we make, he's seen them happen over and over and he knows how to play off of those decisions if they're bad if they're if they're wrong decisions in the first place he knows how to make them even worse and in a world of things, come 
I lost my father 22 years ago to cancer. Uh, my father ate right, exercised, uh, had a good, had a close relationship with the Lord, uh, but he went from healthy to dead in three months because of pancreatic cancer, one of the one of the most deadly cancers that exists. That cancer was not that crucible was not the result of his choice. Uh, it was right. the result of living for work world now my the lord could have prevented that crucible so my let's so let's go back to my the original question parent we as parents do everything in our power to keep our children out of harm's way the ultimate parent god does the opposite he allows us to be placed in harm's way. In fact, not only does he allow us to be placed in harm's way, but in the case of my father, he allowed us to, he, sometimes he allows us to die. So the question yeah. is why? Why does God do, God who is the ultimate parent, why does he do the opposite? of what we as parents do. We as parents uh, spend our time keeping our children out of harm's way. God allows us to be placed in harm's way. Why? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Or, or did you think this was a sermon I was, I was just going to preach? Uh, uh, I, uh, we got some hands. Uh, All right. Sister Robinson. Sister Robinson, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I would say that he has to perfect our character too. And so some adversity must come our way. Uh, of course, we don't want it, uh, but, but it comes. And that's for the uh, perfecting of our character. And two, it could also be uh, if we, if we go through the crucible and, and we pass the test, then it's an example to our family members, uh, other church members, et cetera, that God is good when, it, when the sun shines and, and when it rains in our lives. And that's, to me, that's a great testimony. All right, all right, all right. Excellent. Um, I thought. Uh, Edmund. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This is Barbara Brooks. I'm glad to hear your voice. This but is I... Brooks. Good. <laughs> Excuse me. No, I'm saying good to hear. You. Good to hear. You. But I was going to say, and I and I should have looked the scripture up, but the scripture tells us about the refiner's fire. You know, God puts us through the refined fire that we can come out pure as gold. And so then I also think of the text that says his thoughts are high above our thoughts and his ways are far above our ways. So for him to put us in a crucible, we know that no matter what the crucible is, we have to cling to God's unchanging hand. And the reason I can say that is when I was a lot, lot younger than I am now, there were crucibles in my life that as I went through them, I could see that it was nothing but God's uh, <clears throat> Pardon me, nothing but God's leading. And now I am in a crucible in my life, physically on my own part and on my husband. But it just it just draws me closer and closer to the Word of God, because we have to lean on God's Word no matter what. 
and we think we know what no matter what is. But when life really hits you, and you know you have no other hope but him, and how he brings you through, From morning to morning, his mercy and grace is new every morning. Then the more you're in the crucible, the more you can appreciate his words. And that's what I wanted to say. Well, I heard two, basically two answers um, um, that I, at least let me focus on these two. Sister Robinson talked about refining our characters and Ellen White mentions in the com- in the Ellen White uh, comments or supplemental E.G. White notes which um, I thoroughly enjoy uh, uh, in the opening day's lesson she says in his providence he brings us into position that test our character and watch this reveal defects and weaknesses that have been hidden from our own knowledge. In Amen. other words, God God take God uses the crucible to take things out of us that we didn't know were in us. And 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 the only way that we found out uh, about uh, the the defects in our character um, were God to allow us to go through the crucible. I remember one time I was sitting in my office and, and somebody called me and they were just saying just crazy stuff, just crazy stuff. And and while I never raised my voice or lost my temper, I, I um, inside I began to get very annoyed with this crazy person. And when I, when I, and I'm sure he could hear the edge in my voice that I was tired of talking to him and dealing with his foolishness. And when I hung up, you know what the, you know what the Lord said to me? He said, you are not as far along in your walk with Christ as you thought you were. And your reaction to this person just proved and, and, and God, of course, of course, he was right because he's God, but I would not have seen that defect in my character if I didn't have to go through the crucible of dealing with that crazy person. And so there are things that God uses to refine our characters when we didn't even know our characters needed defining to that degree. And then Sister Brooks said that God used, God allows the crucible because it, he knows that it will allow us to become closer to him. Think about your most agonizing and earnest prayers with uh, prayers to God. I, I call them get ugly prayers. Were you down on the ground, your eyes? are red and your lip are, lips are trembling and mucus is being produced. I, 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 I call them get ugly prayers. Where, when you look like what you're going through. You, you not parents are always, 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 always when we're in the crucible. Nobody gets down on their knees and cries and, 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 and says, oh God, what am I gonna do? I just gotta raise. Nobody prays those prayers. Nobody says, oh God, what am I gonna do? My child just got a four year scholar. No, nobody prays that. It's only when we go through a real crucible sometimes that we pray real prayers. And so hey, what happened? I'm sorry, yes. I apologize. Uh, we have one hand that's been up for a while. Uh, Deacon oh, Miller, no. if you don't mind, been asking. Okay, Deacon Miller, don't go need- ahead. Don't- yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, no. I, 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 my, my brain of thought 
but you know, God will only let us deal with what he knows we can deal with. He don't send us over the edge. And one of the verses that I've got in my head now that I follow is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that means I got what everything I need as long as I get the Lord there. Okay. All right. Thank you. know, you. Brother thank Miller, you. I believe, yes, uh, Deacon Miller, I believe that God won't put me, won't put more on me that I can bear. Here's my problem though. What I think I can bear and what God thinks I can bear are often two mm -hmm. very different things. Yes. And so yes. he he allows he allows us to go through crucibles. And remember, I said earlier, what why it must be difficult to be God because when we are parents, we don't want to see our children hurt. Our, now I don't think my parents ever said this to me when 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 I got disciplined. But you know how. You know, back in the day, parents used to say before they before they laid the belt to your to, to where you sit down, they used to say back in the day, this is this will hurt me more than it will hurt you. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think my father ever said. Um, but, you know, um, but I, maybe my mother said it. And, you know, back in the day, parents did not play like they sometimes seem to play. So I, I never told my mother how, how foolish I thought that statement was. Otherwise, I, would go, I was going to get hurt again. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't until I became a parent that I understood how painful it is to call, have to cause your children pain. When you, I, I, remember, I remember going upstairs to my children's room after having told them to do something and told them the next time I have to tell you to do this and you haven't done it, there's going to be consequences. And I remember walking up the steps saying, God, please help them to have done it this time. Because, mm -hmm. because I, I couldn't, I wasn't going back down but I did not want to cause my children pain. Imagine what it's like to be God, to allow things in, to allow things to place his children in the, in the ultimate crucibles, knowing that it's gonna cause them pain, but just like our parents saying, this is for your good. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We don't understand it as adults when God mm -hmm. does it any more than we understood it as kids when our parents do, did, do, do it. And so being a parent, you know, uh, um, um, part of what I do now in this job is I provide and, and your former president and I do it together. Dr. Cox's office is next to mine. And, and so when new presidents get elected, uh, our responsibility is to go to them and provide an orientation. And what doc, one of the things Dr. Cox says all the time at every orientation is if, if being a light is something that's necessary in your life, if you have to be light, then this is not the job for you. And, and similarly, you, in order to do your job as a parent, you have to understand that there are days, especially when your children are teenagers, when they can't stand you. <laughs> because you are, I used to tell my yeah. children, I used to tell my children, you want to be, you, you, we have two different agendas. You, you trying to be popular. You trying to be cute. You trying to be with your friends. I understand that. 
But that's not at the top of my agenda. At the top of my agenda is not you being liked, it's not you being cute, it's not you being popular, it's being sane. And whatever comes into conflict with that is not happening in this house. And oh, there were days when my children did not like their father, you know? Um, but I, what I was doing, however imperfectly, because I made, I made about a zillion mistakes, but God makes no mistakes and everything that he, every crucible that he allows has one purpose and that's to save us. But can you imagine how painful it must be to be God, to, 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 to the, one of the worst things, there, there is nothing worse than seeing your child suffer and there's nothing you can do, right? Um, I went before my child, my daughter had her first child, um, she had a miscarriage and it was a, it was a painful thing because my child, my child was in absolute grief over the loss of her child and I never will forget sitting in my, my daughter's home, her, her, her husband and my wife had gone to get some medicine for her and sitting in my daughter's home, it was just she and I, and just seeing the pain in her face and there wasn't a thing I can do, I could do about it. Imagine what it's like to be God. He, had, he goes through that a zillion times. Only unlike me, there is something he could do about it. But if he did it, he would place our salvation in jeopardy. Can, can you imagine how difficult you think the crucible is hard for you? But as hard as it is for you, it's even harder for God. I'm gonna say that again. You think the crucible is hard for you, but it's even harder for God because he, and that is the position of watching his children suffer in the crucible being able to do something about it, but realizing that if he does, it will jeopardize our salvation. And, do, and he does it knowing that it will cause us to question and even turn away from God, turn our backs on God because he allowed us to go into a, the the very crucible that he knew we needed in order to save us. So as hard as the crucible is for us, it's even harder for God. All right, let's go on to Sunday, the spirit of truth, okay? God tells in John chapter 16, verses five to 15, it talks about the, the work of the Holy Spirit, which is to guide us into, into all, all truth, tells us um, when we're doing wrong and then tells us how to do right, right? And so when the Spirit the truth about God and sin and crucibles. And then says, in view of what I just showed you, what are you going to do? And here's the thing. Here's the thing. The, the challenge that most of us have with God is we, we do the things that draw us close to God. So we, you know, we, 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 we come, we study our Sabbath school, we come to church, 
You know, we do the things that draw us closer to God. And that's a good thing. But here's the bad thing about the good thing. All right. Here's the bad thing. And, and Elder Evan, you're saying, what can be bad about being drawn closer to God? I'm glad you asked that question. Here's the bad thing. There's actually two bad things. Being drawn close to God is contrary to our nature, right? Now, and so when I say it's a bad thing, it's a bad thing to us. It's not a bad thing, but it's a bad thing to us because it's contrary to our nature. I have a sweet tooth. One of my favorite foods is apple pie. The, the, I, I had the, the sad privilege of seeing Hazel Gillen Who's a who's a who's one of our one of the charter members of Southeast too, my mom's best friend, and I had the sad privilege of visiting and praying for Hazel Gillian the day before she died. I, I my brother and I were probably her last visitors, okay. Um, and Hazel Gillian made the world one of the great apple pies in, in the world. She, she was a great apple pie maker, um, and I. I I remember though, after I left home and got married, um, I decided I, you know, I wanted to eat a little healthier. So I, I kept my apple pies, but I started eating sugar-free apple pie. And, and Elder Books, I remember the first sugar-free apple pie I made after years of eating Hazel Gillian's pies. It was terrible. It was terrible. And the reason why it was terrible it wasn't because it was terrible. It was because by nature, I had become used to eating what wasn't, what wasn't best for me. By nature, we don't want stuff that's good for us. So that when the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, our natural tendency is to resist it. Right. And the scary thing about getting closer to God is the closer the, the closer I get to God, the more I see what's wrong with me. The closer I get to God, the more I see that the more things in my life I have to see, the more things in my life that I see, I have to change. The problem is, by nature, I don't want to change. The things that the Holy Spirit are telling me to change are things that I like. And that's the reason why the only people who, who, are, the only people who are going to be saved are people who love Jesus enough to do what he says, even when what he says our goals against what I want. And here's the thing that's even, here's, here's the thing that's even more diabolical about what the devil does. The, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, but the devil will then use people, the people around us to tell us that we don't have to do what the Spirit of God tells us we need to do this the hard lesson i've learned in 44 years of being a pastor is no matter how wrong a person is there's always somebody telling them that they're right and some of those people are church members i'm gonna say it again one of the hard lessons I've learned in 44 years of being a pastor is no matter how wrong a person is, there's always somebody telling that person that they're right. And, and often that person is a church member. So here's the Holy Spirit coming along, guiding us into truth. And, and, and because the closer you get to God, the more he reveals uh, things to you in your life 
that once upon a time you didn't think were wrong. But as you get close to God, things that you thought were okay, you found out, you find out are not, are not okay. And here's the test of whether we are going to continue to grow. The reason why people stop growing is because eventually the Holy Spirit tells them that they have to do something or stop doing something and they don't want to hear it. And so we have this unerring ability to talk us out, to find reasons why we don't have to do what God tells us to do. And the devil will send people. And if we can't think of a reason ourselves, the devil will send people. I call them cheerleaders to hell. People who will tell us that we don't have to do what God tells us to do. And so that's where most of us, that's where all of us who stop growing, that's the reason why we stop growing. Because we get to a certain point the spirit of God guides us into truth, but truth is, but that, 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 that guidance is progressive. So we keep on going. And then we get to that point where God says, no, nah, no, nah, now you got to give up something that you really don't want to give up. And so then we start, hey, we, we get real creative in thinking of stuff. <laughs> I remember as a young pastor, one of my church leaders, I found out he was having an affair. And so I went to him. I'm, I'm young. This, this brother is old enough to be my father. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm a young pastor. And, I'm, and this is one of my church leaders. And I go to him and I say, my brother, I hear, tell, tell me about this relationship. What's going on? And you know what he told me? I will never forget. This was a thousand years ago when I was young. This, this is what he said to me. He said, I believe that the Lord is going to be glorified in this relationship. Now, you have an affair. But you telling me that God is going to be glorified in your, your cheating on your wife. Who, by the way, look better than a person that you're cheating with. You know, <laughs> sin, makes, sin makes you dumb. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but we have an un... That's the reason why you cannot depend on anything other than thus saith the Lord. Because you will talk yourself out of the church and into hell and it will make sense to you. Because temptation is nothing more than the devil telling you something that you know is wrong, but you want to do anyway. Uh, Pastor, uh, can I interrupt you one time? A couple of, couple of good okay. comments on, on our uh, chat uh, tonight. Tell me about it. Uh, Tell me about it. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Nisi said, uh, well, uh, Deacon Miller, he said, the worst thing Satan did was trick Eve and uh, even uh, Adam eat and even Eden into eating the forbidden fruit. That's number one. And uh, Nisi uh, said, our, our friend Nisi said, being born again with water and the Holy Spirit of truth, so that He can teach us, work on us, in us through through us. Therefore, do not make the Holy Spirit sad, nor stop the word of the Holy Spirit because we need the spirit of truth. Our salvation is serious. It is our choice. And then uh, um, Sister Dixon said, uh, the closer we are to God, we are, we are shown our defects and we know we have much work to do and the Holy Spirit is how we find out. And then Elder, um, Elder Hood, uh, Lisa Hood said, my Lord, this is so powerful on all levels. Anisi agreed, as, and uh, uh, she, Elder Hood said, you better preach. <laughs> Elder Hood, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. That is a mouthful that uh, Pastor said in that 
it, it, it's just a truth. It's just the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us all, God. And I, you know, I remember there were questions that I had in my in my in my walk with God, and it's like I I I thought that I had um, a good working knowledge of the Word, and what I gleaned from the Word, it appeared as though the position that I was taking was the correct position. Yet I had no peace. It continued to cause friction. And so I continued to pray and ask God, look, you have to show me because, you know, I can't see the forest from the trees in this thing here. And to God be the glory, he's such a wonderful God that he doesn't want us to be lost on a on a technicality or he doesn't want us to be lost because of our self-deception. And what I love about God is when our heart's desire is really to do his will, he's going to let us know. And like pastor says, now at that point, it's now up to me. Okay, Lisa, you've been asking, you say you want what you want. Now you got it. What are you going to do with it? And so, you know, God is such a, a, a I understand. To, I, I'm just excited and I'm just pumped because, you know, we hear every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess because of what is being said tonight. Nobody, nobody, I will not, I'm going to speak about me. I will not have an excuse as to why I miss out on heaven. I don't intend to. However, if I do, it will be nobody's fault but my own, because what we're talking about, the crucibles and the things that God allowed me to come into, to, to you know, come into my space or, or the challenges, God wants me to be fit for the kingdom. And so I thank God for the word tonight. Bless you, Pastor, President, and to God be the glory. Well, thank you, Elder Hood. Now, I'm not, am, are you are you first ladyhood as well, or am I, or then I'm, am I putting you with the pastor and I shouldn't be? Yes, sir, I am. Oh, so, are you the one that <laughs> talked your husband out of coming when I tried to get him to come? <laughs> no, I, no, I I've did known not. <laughs> no, I know. I've known your husband's family for years. Knew your mother-in-law and your brother-in-law. Um, wonderful family. Wonderful family. All right, thank thank you so much. But here's the thing, the the here's 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 the thing. This this shows you how mixed up we are. God uses the crucible to point out the defects in us, right? But here's the here here's how here's how messed up we are. We that we want to keep some of those defects. So so so. So some, so sometimes, right? We have somebody, somebody offends us. We want to tell them off, you know. Um, 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 we, a lot of us struggle, me included, with with not always eating the way we need to. Eat. We want to eat like that. You know what it reminds me of when, when I was grow when I was a little boy growing up down the street from your, your church, our, which was my church. Um, back in the day, you know, your 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 parents would say, "Now, you know, when you come home from school, don't don't you know, don't play in your your good your good clothes, your good school clothes, because they didn't want you like like falling down and and putting and and putting a hole, tearing a hole in your in, in your in your pants." You know, um, you know, my, my mother, my, my mother hated that. Um, in fact, you know, if, if I didn't, if, if I, if, if I didn't, if, if I didn't heed her instruction and, and I, and, and I, you know, sometimes you get little, little holes in your knee, you know, in your, in, in the knee of your pant legs. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, if, if you, if you went around with too many holes, then you know you'd make your parents look bad because you, you would say, "Man, these these people are too poor to to patch up all the holes in their clothes." Well, nowadays, nowadays the 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 more expensive the jeans are, the more holes they seem to have. In it. It, it it amuses me to watch people buy stuff with holes when 
when I was growing up, that you tried to avoid that. And so in my office one time, uh, we were sitting around talking and, and the, the chief financial officer was telling the story of one of her nephews. He came home, brought his, brought, brought his clothes home, his grand, the grandmother um, washed the jeans. And then she noticed all the holes in the jeans. And don't you know, she sewed those holes up thinking that she was she was being she was doing uh, her grandson a favor when he saw the whole that his the all the holes that he spent all the money getting when he saw those jeans were were sewn up and he had no more holes he was mad he wanted the holes in his genes. You and I have holes in our spirituality. And the Holy Ghost comes along and, and, and tells us how to, how to sew up those holes in our characters. But you know what? We like the holes in our characters. And when those holes get pointed out, and when the Holy Ghost tries to sew, sew them up, we resist. Because responding to the, to the voice of the Holy Spirit goes against our nature. And God is simply trying to save us. And he will do anything short of trying to control our will. And, and, and Ellen White says in the comments, she says, I saw evil angels contending for souls and the angel of God resisting them. She said evil angels were crowding around the souls, corrupting the atmosphere with their poisonous influence. And holy angels were anxiously watching the souls and were waiting to drive back Satan's host. But it is not the work of the good angels to control our will against our will. And, and if, but see, but see, the Lord loves us so much that there's hope even in this statement, because even though, even though um, we've made a choice not to allow the, the angels to, to, to resist, help us to resist temptation, she says, then the angels can do but little more than hold in check the host of Satan that they should not destroy until further light is given to those in peril. So God loves us so much that even though he won't make us, what he will do is make the devil not destroy us. That's a, that's a powerful statement right there that even in our foolish, in our foolish humanity, we so up the holes in our character that the devil is trying to get, get rid of, that God doesn't leave us. But he says, okay, I, I'm not going to make you, but what I will do is make the devil not destroy you. All right. Uh, brother, brother Barry, am I missing any, am I missing anybody or you want me to keep going? No, you're fine. Go right okay. ahead, okay. sir. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to leave any doubt. The discipline will. Remember, we talked about. Faith, we talked about going against our own human nature, which means we can't. We cannot trust our feelings, right? We can't. Um, we can't go. Um, uh, we can't do what feels right to us because the Bible says a couple of things. The Bible says there, you know, we are so corrupt in our thinking. It's almost to the place where if you find yourself feeling a certain, that, that a certain thing is right, you almost need to do the opposite because our feelings are so often wrong. It's, it's, it's like what, what C.D. Brooks used to say, and, 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 and only us old folk remember C.D. Brooks, but C.D. Brooks used to say, um, 
um, um, and he he was my he was he was my favorite my favorite preacher. One of the last things I did in in as president was attend his funeral. Um, but he used to say, um, um, if you see, if you want to know the right thing to do, then find out what the crowd is doing and do the opposite, because the crowd is never right. You know, and, and if you historically, though, and that's why the Bible talks about the broad way and the narrow way. The, the way to hell is an eight lane highway and there's a bunch of folk on it. You know, uh, the, in fact, the Bible says not only are most people not on the right road, the Bible says few there be that find it. And the reason why they can't find it is not because it's difficult to find, but it goes against our feelings and our, in, our natural inclinations. Remember what I said? Mm. Remember how I, how I define how we define temptation? Temptation isn't temptation unless it has three elements. The first element is it's got to be wrong actually four elements. Number two, not only does it have to be wrong, but you got to know it's wrong. It's, it's sin is not sin if you don't know that it's sin. Number three, it has to be, you, 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 it has to be wrong. It has to, it has to be something you know is wrong, but it has to be something you want to do. I'm not tempted to smoke cigarettes. Don't want to smoke. Never smoke. Don't want to smoke. That's not a temptation. So the devil don't even bother me with that. But what he does is he bothers me with the stuff he knows I want to do. But here's the fourth element of temptation. Remember I said number one, it has to be something that's wrong. It has to be something that you know it's wrong. It has to be something that you know is wrong, but you want to do anyway. But here's the fourth element of temptation. There has to be a way out of it. Because God says, I'm not going to allow you to be tempted without giving you a way out. But taking that way out goes against our feelings and our, our inclinations. All of us who are married know that there's a point where you're arguing with your wife and your spouse. I know all of you are holy and sanctified and you never have arguments with your wife. But let me, let me confess that, that even though I'm, I, I know how blessed I am and even though we argue a lot less now than we did when we were younger, because now I realize that a lot of the stuff that I thought was such a big deal when I was younger is not is not a big deal. And that if I want my wife to put up with me when I'm crazy, then I need to put up with her when I think she's crazy. And sometimes the best thing to do is just keep quiet and let the storm blow over. And I'm a lot better at that now than when I was younger. But I will, and, 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 and I know that sisterhood doesn't know anything about that, that but I will confess that there are times when I have driven and, you know, I don't, my job is, my job takes me all over the country. So I'm not dry, when I'm, when I'm driving to church, I'm not driving to a church in town. I'm driving to a couple, a couple hundred miles. And there have been times, I remember one time where my wife and I, we, it, we were we were driving for three hours. We must have argued for a good two hours. I was so mad at her when I got when when I got to church, um, and, and and so. But then you know you can't you can't you can't let everybody else see that you mad. So we got out of church. We just smiling, happy Sabbath, you know. And but my wife knew I was mad at her, and so mm -hmm. so so sent me a little note. Let's. Let's come come outside, come off the pulpit, and let's pray. I was so mad, I didn't even want to pray. Uh, so, but, you know, we, we, I'm just telling the truth. I, I know Elder and Mrs. Hood don't know anything about that. Mercy. I, I, 
just I'm 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 because I'm 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 not as ready for translation as some of y'all are. Okay, but <laughs> but but there are times when when those of you who are not holy as the re as as some of the rest of you, there are times when that voice in you in you in that Holy Spirit says, "Stop talking. You know you're wrong." And there and 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 if you're honest, you plunge right on in anyway. Kept on arguing even though you knew that you are wrong, okay? Because yielding to the Holy Spirit goes against our nature. Even when the Holy Spirit said, no, listen, you know you're wrong. Stop talking, say you're sorry and, and, and call it a day. But, but yeah. you, 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 you keep on going. You plan, yeah. The Holy Spirit sets that red light and you, you, you crash right on through that rat, crash and burn. <laughs> I know, no, I know none of y'all know anything. I know none of y'all know anything. Know anything. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and the lesson talks about times that that people got in trouble based on their on doing what their feelings said rather than the, what the spirit yeah. said. And the worst example they gave is the example of David. Now the Bible calls David a man after his own heart. It wasn't like God didn't know what David was gonna do, but that shows you the power of grace that God called David what he was not before he became what he was. He knew, God knew what David was gonna do, but he said, he's a man after my own heart because I, he's gonna ask for forgiveness and I'm gonna give it to him. And so now I'm telling you what he, what he will be, even though I know the mistakes that he's gonna make on his way to becoming what I'm telling you he will be. And praise the Lord that not only does God say that about David, but he says that about us who says amen, right? But but David does a terrible thing. He's out, he's out there on the rooftop. He's probably studying his Sabbath school lesson, you know? But then he sees Bathsheba puts his quarterly down, no daily lesson study that day because, and, 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 and notice, notice what the Bible says. David sees her. He inquires of her. And, 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 and somebody says, is this not Bathsheba? And it does, he doesn't stop there. The wife of Uriah the Hittite. That's God sending that final red light. Don't do it, David. That's somebody's wife. He could have just said, that's Bathsheba. But no, it didn't stop there. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. This is somebody you trying to get it, join your church. Uriah wasn't even a, he wasn't even a Jew yet. I mean, not a Jew yet. He wasn't even a, a follower of Christ at that point. At least that's, that, that's my, that's me talking. He said the Hittite, all right? Um, um, or maybe he had joined, but he, but, but that was not something he had done from birth. That's what I'm trying to say. So David had a responsibility to set the example. And, but he ran on through that red light because that is our nature. The good thing is that we, that even though we have no ability to resist Christ on our own, what we can do is surrender our will and ask God to help us help to ask God to do for us. Peter talks about the, I mean, Paul talks about the struggle, but it's a struggle that God helps us make. All right, I'm gonna close here, cause, I, cause it's, it's, in fact, I'm gonna close now. I'm gonna close now, cause it's 9.30. All right, so any, uh, any final- I, I just want you to know, I just want you to know, if, 
you know, we're, it's 9.30, but nobody's leaving. So, you know, if you've got a few more minutes, I'm quite sure it would be a problem. That's up to you, but it, we're, we're open. No, I'm going to... Uh, uh, I am a, uh, the people I'm and ending on. One, um, I heard a picture uh, say one time, blessed are the brief for they will be invited back. So, um, <laughs> I, I, so, so that, so that, so that, so that I can come back again one day, I will stop and let you go when I'm supposed to. But I want to thank you, Elder Brooks, for the kind invitation. Thank you, my friends, both uh, those who, um, who I, who I, who I knew. Um, from my days there and, and those who uh, who came after I left, thank you for giving of your time in, in the study of God's word tonight. Amen. Amen. We have a question. Uh, Deacon Miller, you, you had a question or comment? No, I don't have a question, but I want to just say, Pastor, we love you. And we really enjoyed your service. You brought a lot of God's word to us. And we look forward to having you more. Amen. Well, Amen. Well, Amen. Well, Barry. Yes. Yes. Go right ahead. I, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I know um, mm, Pastor had wanted to leave, but I just wanted him to touch on Jacob and Esau and Jacob wrestling with Christ. And uh, maybe he'll do that another time. <laughs> oh my. Uh, well, um, I'm sorry, what were you saying, um, Elder Barry? Uh, he, she was saying that uh, she was wondering if you could speak on Esau. Uh, Certainly. And he, he, here's let, let me make, let, let me make, uh, oh, I, I see, I see a word from my, from my cousin, uh, sister Glenn and, and Sherilyn, um, I had a chance to visit with them the last time I was there in Cleveland. Um, sister, sister Halsey is my oldest remaining relative. So it's good to, it's good to hear from her. Um, here's the, let, let me, there's a bunch of things I could say about, um, Jake, but here's here's the one that I'll say. The the thing that the thing that um is that is interesting to me about the crucible that Jacob found himself uh in wrestling with God. There are a couple of things I found interesting. Uh, first of all, the battle started with Jacob praying. You know, he's up here praying, and somebody somebody touches him from behind and that's when it that's when the battle starts and so there are we make the mistake in thinking that praying prevents the but the but the wrestling started while he while he was he was praying and and he was and he was praying because he was in a difficult position but why was he in that difficult position? He was in that difficult position, first of all, because of his own bad choice. But then, secondly, he was in that position because God told him it's time for you to go back home. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he goes back home, Esau, who had left him alone for 20 years, now Esau starts coming. Some mm -hmm. of the crucible think that doing what God says Get, keeps you out of trouble. Sometimes doing what God says sends you directly into the crucible. But here's the thing, that God promises that he will be with you and through he will be with you in the crucible and he will get you out of it. The problem is we have to let God, oh, if you don't remember anything else I say, remember this. We have to allow God to define what getting us out of the crucible means. See, we think getting us out of the crucible means the problem goes away. But Paul 
they for years take my crucible away. And finally, God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. In other words, God does not always promise to take us out of the crucible. He just promises, promises to stay with us through the crucible. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. He closed one more time. You have to Amen. allow God to find what getting you out of the crucible means. Mm -hmm. Okay. All okay. right. Does that answer what you're looking for, uh, Auntie? Uh -huh. Just Brooks? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, okay. We uh, we thank you again. Uh, no, I was asking did that did that help you what you were talking about? Uh, yes. That that answer suffice. suffice? Yes. yes. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, again, I'm glad that everyone came out, and we're going to wrap it up. Um, we're glad again to uh, we're going to wrap it up and. Uh, Elder, we're, Pastor, we're just thankful that you came out. I know, you know, again, you got so much going on, but thanks, man. I really appreciate you coming and uh, teaching us, preaching to us tonight, as well as teaching us. And we thank you for all what you've done. And it's good to see you. Good to see a homeboy from Cleveland that's doing well, has done well. And, you know, your kids are doing great. God has continued to bless your ministry. Man, it's good, good to see you. Uh, you have another uh, question here. Uh, Sister Robinson? Well, it's not a question. I can't let the pastor leave without telling him how much, not only did I enjoy him this evening, but his ministry through the years, but also the effect that his father had on me as a teenager, as a youth in his Sabbath school class. He was a tremendous yeah. teacher and a tremendous uh, leader of youth. And uh, I just just wanted to to for him to hear that. Amen. Well, sister, Amen. thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your kindness to me when I was growing up, um, and thank you very much for your kind words about my father. It so happened I was in I was in a meeting in Orlando, Florida, that I just left yesterday, and ran into. Gilbert Chapman, who I had oh not seen, who I had not seen since I was about 13 years old. And he was kind enough to, to comfort to comfort my heart by saying some of the same things that you, you said about my father. I am enormous. Every, every single day, I thank the Lord for the parents I had, for the Amen. church I went to. And for the churches, Glenville and Southeast that I went to, um, you, all, those of you who were there in those days, and I, I certainly include you, Sister Robinson, in that, were a part of what shaped me, and I'm enormously grateful. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. Uh, yeah, Sister Glenn, I said, got to see your hand is raised. Well, you know this is Sherilyn, but um, I Sherilyn, think- Sherilyn, yes, I know. I think mommy wanted to try to say hi to Dana because now Dana, I've had it uh, on the computer here for mom. Mom's in um, rehab right now, but um, I'm here to make sure she got on Sabbath school. So if, I'm going to see if she'll say hi. Say hi, mom. Did you hear her? I heard her. How's she good? you i was with your brothers a couple of months ago Tar, um uh that was it july june july i was with both carl and tom i went to see carl in the in the rehab and tom came to hear tom came to worship with me uh uh candy and gene had a wonderful time uh, okay so it's good to see you all right, we'll talk with you later. Happy Sabbath, everybody. All right. All right, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, Sister Glenn. Good to hear your voice. Good to see you You're listening tonight. Uh, and she's here every week. She, you know, uh, Sherilyn keeps, keeps her on Sabbath school every week, and I know she enjoys it. 
So thank you so much for coming out every week, uh, Sister Glenn. And uh, we appreciate you and we pray and keep you in our prayers and uh, uh, Cheryl and you as well. Uh, okay, we're gonna wrap it up. I just want you to know that uh, next week, uh, we're going to have uh, Sister, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Sister Bobby Reynolds, Elder Bobby Reynolds from the Alpha Omega Church uh, in Youngstown, Ohio is coming out to teach us next week. And uh, the name of the lesson is Indestructible Hope. <clears throat> so we will see you all next week with that. And again, tonight has proved if you missed Southeast Sabbath School, you missed a lot. And that tonight was just another great one. We just really appreciate it. Uh, Elder, we do have you out on, we will have this out on uh, on our website and not, not our website, but on our, um, not fa I'm thinking Facebook. I got everything else going through my head. YouTube but channel. But we will have, <laughs> YouTube, thank you. Thank you, Elder. Uh, you'll have it on the YouTube channel probably by tomorrow afternoon if anyone wants to pick it up. Uh, matter of fact, you you should it should be there. Again, we thank you all for coming out, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, same time, I want to remind everyone that Kids Corner uh, the last day was today, and we're we will come back. We're going to take a sabbatical, and so we can bring back some better uh, programming for uh, uh, for Kids Corner. So look back, look to see us back on September 9th, Sister Charity is doing a wonderful job and she's going to she's got some great ideas that's going to really rock your world by the time we get back. So, uh so keep us in prayer, keep kids corner in prayer. We're going to have a great time when we come back. All right, uh uh Elder Hood, I don't see I don't see uh, uh Pastor Hood out, so I'm going to drop it in your hands to do our closing prayer if that's okay. Not a problem. Just want to remind everyone tomorrow um, is communion. Well, the brighter side of the Sabbath is communion. Um, pray that all hearts and minds are prepared to receive um, our communion. And then remember, we're preparing for Parabellum, uh, Pastor Hood series. And starting uh, August 7th, which is Sunday through August 27th, we're going to be fasting and praying uh, during the course of Parabellum. And um, we're going to start praying on Sunday from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. every morning. And the information will be a conference number, which Brother Keith will have it uh, on the screen tomorrow. And we look to put something in your hand uh, in reference to um, the prayer. Each week we will pray according to the subject matter. And so please um, come out and, and be supportive and let's cover uh, Pastor Hood and in our endeavors for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And remember what Pastor Hood says, if we want peace, we must prepare for war. And with that being said, most kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the lesson tonight um, with um, our, our, our um, pastor and, and, and friend, um, uh, Pastor Edmonds and uh, Dr. Edmonds, Lord God. And I pray that as we separate from this place, never from your presence, that all that we've gleaned tonight has found a resting place in each and every one of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you give us a peaceful night's rest. And for those who endeavor to be in the house of worship, that uh, you bring us all together on the brighter side of the Sabbath. We thank you for our leadership team in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 All right. Good night, everyone. Again, when you miss Southeast Sabbath School, you've missed a lot. Thank you, Elder. We appreciate your closing remarks. We'll see you tomorrow at noon for communion, and we're going to have a great time there. So be ready, be humble. Let's see you tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Good night, and have a good yeah. evening. Get a good night's rest. All right. Blessings. Good night, Excellent lesson. Good night everyone. God bless you. All right. All right. Have a good one. Good to see everybody out. Have a good night. You too.